Lunar Society of Birmingham The Lunar Society of Birmingham was a dinner club and informal learned society of prominent figures in the Midlands Enlightenment, including industrialists, natural philosophers and intellectuals, who met regularly between 1765 and 1813 in Birmingham, England. At first called the Lunar Circle, Lunar Society became a formal name by 1775. The name arose because the society would meet during the full moon, as the extra light made the journey home easier and safer in the absence of street lighting. The members cheerfully referred to themselves as lunatics, a pun on lunatics. Venues included Erasmus Darwin's home in Litchfield, Matthew Bolton's home, Soho House, Bowbridge House in Derbyshire, and Great Bar Hall. The Lunar Society evolved through various degrees of organization over a period of up to 50 years, but was only ever an informal group. No constitution, minutes, publications, or membership lists survive from any period, and evidence of its existence and activities is found only in the correspondence and notes of those associated with it. Historians therefore disagree on what qualifies as membership of the Lunar Society, who can be considered to have been members, and even when the society can be said to have existed. Josiah Wedgwood, for example, is described by some commentators as being one of five principal members of the society, while others consider that he cannot be recognized as a full member at all. Dates given for the establishment of the society range from sometime before 1760 to 1775. Some historians argue that it had ceased to exist by 1791, others that it was still operating as late as 1813. Despite this uncertainty, 14 individuals have been identified as having verifiably attended Lunar Society meetings regularly over a long period during its most productive eras, these are Matthew Bolton, Erasmus Darwin, Thomas Day, Richard Lovell Edgeworth, Samuel Galton Jr., James Kerr, Joseph Priestley, William Small, Jonathan Stokes, James Watt, Josiah Wedgwood, John Whitehurst, and William Withering. While the Society's meetings provided its name and social focus, however, they were relatively unimportant in its activities, and far more activity and communication took place outside the meetings themselves. Members local to Birmingham were in almost daily contact, more distant ones in correspondence at least weekly. A more loosely defined group has therefore been identified over a wider geographical area in longer time period, who attended meetings occasionally and who corresponded or cooperated regularly with multiple other members on group activities. These include Richard Kirwan, John Smeaton, Henry Moyes, John Michel, Peter Camper, R. Eraspa, John Baskerville, Thomas Beddoes, John Wyatt, William Thompson, Cyril Jackson, Jean Andre Deluc, John Wilkinson, John Ash, Samuel Moore, Robert Bage, James Brindley, Ralph Griffiths, John Roebuck, Thomas Percival, Joseph Black, James Hutton, Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Banks, William Herschel, Daniel Solander, John Warltire, George Fordyce, Alexander Blair, Samuel Parr, Louis Joseph Dalbert Dye, William Eames, the seventh Duke of Chons, Barthélemy Fauges de Saint Fond, Grossert de Verley, Johann Gottling, and Joseph Wright. This lack of a defined membership has led some historians to criticize a lunar society legend, leading people to confuse it and its efforts with the general growth of intellectual and economic activities in the provinces of 18th century Britain. Others have seen this both as real and as one of the society's main strengths. A paper read at the Science Museum in London in 1963 claimed that of all the provincial philosophical societies it was the most important, perhaps because it was not merely provincial. All the world came to Soho to meet Bolton, Watt or Small, who were acquainted with the leading men of science throughout Europe and America. Its essential sociability meant that any might be invited to attend its meetings. The origins of the Lunar Society lie in a pattern of friendships that emerged in the late 1750s. Matthew Bolton and Erasmus Darwin met some time between 1757 and 1758, possibly through family connections, as Bolton's mother's family were patients of Darwin, or possibly those shared friendships, as both were admirers of the printer John Baskerville and friends of the astronomer and geologist John Michel a regular visitor to Darwin's house in Litchfield. Darwin was a physician and poet who had studied at Cambridge and Edinburgh. Bolton had left school at 14 and started work in his father's business making metal goods in Birmingham at the age of 21. Despite their different backgrounds they shared a common interest in experiment and invention, and their activities would show Darwin's theoretical understanding and Bolton's practical experience to be complementary. Soon they were visiting each other regularly and conducting investigations into scientific subjects such as electricity, 
meteorology and geology. Around the same time the Derby-based clockmaker John Whitehurst became a friend, first of Bolton and subsequently of Darwin, through his business supplying clock movements to Bolton's Ormolu manufacturing operation. Although older than both Bolton and Darwin, by 1758 Whitehurst was writing to Bolton telling excitedly of a pyrometer he had built, and looking forward to visiting Birmingham to spend one day with you in trying all necessary experiments. Bolton, Darwin and Whitehurst were in turn introduced by Michel to Benjamin Franklin when he traveled to Birmingham in July 1758 to improve and increase acquaintance among persons of influence, and Franklin returned in 1760 to conduct experiments with Bolton on electricity and sound. Although Michel seems to have withdrawn slightly from the group when he moved to Thornhill, near Dewsbury, in 1767, Franklin was to remain a common link among many of the early members. The nature of the group was to change significantly with the move to Birmingham in 1765 of the Scottish physician William Small, who had been professor of natural philosophy at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. There he had taught and been a major influence over Thomas Jefferson, and had formed the focus off a local group of intellectuals. His arrival with a letter of introduction to Matthew Bolton from Benjamin Franklin was to have a galvanizing effect on the existing circle which began to explicitly identify itself as a group and actively started to attract new members. The first of these was Josiah Wedgwood, who became a close friend of Darwin in 1765 while campaigning for the building of the Trent and Mersey Canal and subsequently closely modeled his large new pottery factory at Etruria on Bolton's Soho manufactory. Another new recruit, Richard Lovell Edgeworth, met Darwin, Small and Bolton in 1766 through a shared interest in carriage design and he in turn introduced his friend and fellow Rousseau admirer Thomas Day, with whom he had studied at Corpus Christi, Oxford. In 1767 James Kerr visited Darwin in Litchfield, where he was introduced to Bolton, Small, Wedgwood and Whitehurst and subsequently decided to move to Birmingham. The Lunar Circle also attracted more distant involvement. Joseph Priestley, then living in Leeds and a close friend of John Mitchell, became associated with the Society in 1767 when Darwin and Wedgwood became involved with his work on electricity. In the same year James Watt visited Birmingham on the recommendation of his business patron John Roebuck, being shown around the Soho manufactory by Small and Darwin in Bolton's absence. Although neither Priestley nor Watt were to move to Birmingham for several years, both were to be in constant communication with the Birmingham members and central to the Circle's activities from 1767. By 1768 the core group of nine individuals who would form the nucleus of the Lunar Society had come together with small at their heart. The group at this time is sometimes referred to as the Lunar Circle, though this is a later description used by historians, and the group themselves used a variety of specific descriptions, including Birmingham philosophers or simply fellow schemers. If William Small's arrival in 1765 had been the catalyst to the development of the Lunar Circle as a cohesive group, his death probably from malaria, in 1775 was to mark another change in its structure. Small had been the key link between the members, and in his absence those remaining moved to place the group on a more organized footing. Meetings were to be held on the Sunday nearest the full moon, lasting from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 8 o'clock in the evening. The first was probably that held on December 31, 1775, and the lunar name is first recorded in 1776. The era also saw significant changes in membership. William Withering, like Small a physician, was already an acquaintance of Darwin, Bolton and Wedgwood when moved from Stafford to Birmingham and became a member of the Society in 1776. John Whitehurst's move to London in 1775 had a less dramatic effect, he kept in regular contact with other members of the Society and remained an occasional attender of meetings. The leading figure behind the establishment of the society as a more organized body during this early period seems to have been Matthew Bolton, his home at Soho House in Hansworth was the principal venue for meetings, and in 1776 he is recorded as planning to make many motions to the members respecting new laws, and regulations, such as will tend to prevent the decline of a society which I hope will be lasting. This reliance on Bolton was also to prove a weakness, however. As the period coincided with the peak of his work building up his steam engine business and he was frequently absent. Although the 1770s was one of the society's richest eras in terms of its collaborative achievements, the society's meetings declined from regular occurrences in 1775 to infrequent ones by the end of the decade. In late 1780 the nature of the society was to change again with the move to Birmingham of Joseph Priestley. 
Priestley had been closely associated with the group's activities for over a decade and was a strong advocate of the benefits of scientific societies. Shortly after his arrival lunar meetings moved from Sunday afternoons to Mondays to accommodate Priestley's duties as a clergyman, while the society's dependence on Matthew Bolton was lessened by holding meetings at other members' houses in addition to Soho House. The result was to be the society's most productive era. Several other major new figures became associated with the society during this period. Samuel Galton Jr., unusual as a Quaker who was also a gun manufacturer, appears in the letters of other lunar members as attending meetings from July 1781, and his daughter Marianne Schimmelpenning was to provide one of the few first-hand accounts of the Lunar Society's activities. The botanist and physician Jonathan Stokes, who had known William Withering as a child, moved to Stourbridge and started attending Lunar Society meetings from 1783. His contribution to the Society was significant but short-lived. After collaborating with Withering on his botanical arrangement of British plants the two quarreled bitterly and Stokes severed his relations with the main lunar members by 1788. The society also lost several major figures over the period. Richard Lovell Edgeworth ceased regular involvement in the society's activities when he returned to Ireland in 1782, John Whitehurst died in London in 1788, and Thomas Day died the following year. Most significantly, Erasmus Darwin moved to Derby in 1781. But although he complained of being cut off from the milk of science, he continued to attend Lunar Society meetings at least until 1788. The outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789 caused political strains between members of the Society, but it was the priestly riots of 1791 in Birmingham itself that saw a decisive falling off of the Society's spirit and activities. Joseph Priestley himself was driven from the town, leaving England entirely for the United States in 1794. William Withering's house was invaded by rioters and Matthew Bolton and James Watt had to arm their employees to protect the Soho manufactory. Lunar meetings were continued by the younger generation of the families of earlier lunar members, including Gregory Watt, Matthew Robinson Bolton, Thomas Wedgwood and James Watt Jr., and possibly Samuel Tertius Galton. Regular meetings are recorded into the 19th century, 8 in 1800, 5 or 6 before August 1801 and at least 1 in 1802 while as late as 1809 Leonard Horner was describing the remnant of the Lunar Society as being very interesting. While individual members continued to produce work of importance, however, the collaborative activity that marked the heyday of the Society was noticeably absent. The Society had definitely collapsed by 1813, however, in August of that year Samuel Galton Jr. is recorded as having won a ballot for possession of the scientific books from the Society's library. Among memorials to the Society and its members are the Moonstones, two statues of Watt and a statue of Bolton, Watt and Murdoch by William Bloy, and the Museum at Soho House, all in Birmingham. In more recent times a new Lunar Society was formed in Birmingham by a group led by Dame Rachel Waterhouse. Its aim is to play a leading part in the development of the city and the wider region. In Italy, the Lunar Society Italia was formed to communicate science and astronomy. In Australia, the Lunatics Society of Newcastle was formed by leading digital entrepreneurs, software developers, educators, film producers, creatives, investors to encourage creative thinking and new ideas in a digital age. In the latter part of the 20th century, the University of Birmingham Lunar Society met every Thursday to debate and discuss all manner of topics in the Guild Bar. In 2011, Steps were undertaken to reform the discussion society as an alternative to the more regulated debate options available at the university. This was agreed by the university's Guild of Students in autumn 2012. The society now hosts symposiums every two weeks. Any member has always been welcome to suggest a topic for discussion. These meetings occur in a variety of environments from university rooms to local bars. In 2013, the society attempted to change the name of one of the rooms in the Guild of Students to the Lunar Room in honor of the original Birmingham Lunar Society. Like the Oxford Union, the society has always traditionally put a huge emphasis on freedom of speech. The society has similar aims to the Speculative Society of Edinburgh University. Today, the Lunar Society is an informal academic association open to both undergraduate and graduate students, as well as professional academics, from the University of Birmingham. It has obtained a reputation for the variety of the topics discussed at its meetings. The Lunar Society puts itself forward as being committed to providing an open forum for academic discussion, which it does by hosting regular symposiums on a range of topics from current affairs to philosophy, science and art.
The format for these symposiums is a roundtable-style discussion. The society agrees to debate a series of topics in advance of the meeting, and every member is given an opportunity to participate in the discussion. To ensure the discussion retains order they are presided over by a chairperson. In keeping with the tradition of the society and to help with identification, the chairperson wears the Connor Clark Academic Robe, donated to the society by a previous Lunar Society president. Freedom of speech has played an integral part of the society's history. The society was founded as a resistance to the more regulated debate societies on campus. To ensure this freedom of speech, the society follows the Chatham House rule. Those who attend are free to use the content discussed at meetings but must not identify the speaker. The society is supported by a committee, who help coordinate topics, organize and publicize events, ensure a rotating chair and undertake fundraising. A number of noted University of Birmingham alumni have been involved with the society's committee. Former members of the society have gone on to senior positions in the media and business. Past presidents of the society have been published in academic journals, and featured on the University of Birmingham University Challenge Team. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.